For the next set of slides, uh, now we're going to talk about model-based reinforcement learning. Okay, so everything that we've discussed so far was model-free, but there is also a set of algorithms that are model-based, and today we're going to start discussing those. Okay, so I'm going to introduce what is model-based reinforcement learning, and then we'll see in particular one framework called Dyna. Um, that in fact combines model-based reinforcement learning with model-free, and we'll see one very important algorithm, Monte Carlo Tree Search, because it was uh, critical in terms of making progress in games, especially the game of Go. Okay, so as a recap, we talked about model-free reinforcement learning where what it means is that we don't have any explicit transition or reward model, right? So we're directly evaluating uh, a value function, as in Q-learning, or perhaps we're directly optimizing a policy, as in policy gradient technique, or maybe we're doing both simultaneously, as in actor critique techniques, okay? So all of these methods are all model free. And then the idea is that you see at every time step, there's a loop that goes around, right? Where um, perhaps the, an action is executed, the environment sends back the state and the reward. And what the agent does based on that is to update a policy or value function, right? So depending on which method we consider, right? We're going to update either a policy or value function. But there's no notion of model that is being updated here. So this is model-free reinforcement learning. Now we can also consider model-based reinforcement learning where this time we're going to have an explicit transition and or reward model. Right? So some techniques are going to have both, an explicit transition and a reward model. Some of them are just going to have one of the two, but the idea is that some, at least one of those two is going to be explicitly represented. Now, when we have both the transition and the reward model, what we can do is to also plan based on the model. So one of the benefits for this is that we can often increase the sample efficiency. So in other words, the amount of interactions that we do with the environment can be decreased because once we have a model, Right? Instead of trying to get data from the environment by interacting with the environment, we can simply use our model and essentially plan by thinking simply what would be the best actions. And we don't need to interact with the environment for this. We can simply use our model to um, optimize what might be a good value function or a good policy. Um, now the drawback of model-based techniques is often that they are much more complex. So the picture now becomes as follows. So here the agent is going to do two things. Right? So when it receives a state and a reward from the environment, the first thing it's going to do is to update its model. And then based on its model, then after that it's going to do some planning. And then the planning is going to help it choose what might be a good action, and, and also update its policy and, and value function. So you see in comparison to the previous picture, now what we've essentially done is insert this notion that we're going to update the model and do some planning. So, so that's why I guess in, in practice, uh, these approaches tend to be heavier because you also have to um, implement something for the model, how to update it, and also something for the planning part. But once you do that, and you do that right, then there are some benefits. So you can often increase the sample efficiency, which means that you might need less data, less interactions with the environment to arrive at a good policy. And this is becoming quite uh, popular these days because we've had a lot of success with environments uh, in simulation like games. So um, you're currently doing an assignment with um, OpenAI and, and there uh, there's lots of environments and essentially what OpenAI is, it's, it's a simulator. It's a, 
There's a bunch of environments, and then you can train some agents with respect to the simulator. But really, the only cost here is in terms of time and computation. Uh, but really, it doesn't matter if your agent is interacting a lot with the simulator otherwise. Okay? Now, in practice, um, you might not have a simulator, or you might be in a situation where the agent is interacting with the real world, with, with actual users, and now it matters how well they're performing. It's not just a question of, of time and, and, and computational complexity, but um, there might be some direct impact on users, on customers, and then you want to often minimize the amount of interaction that's needed to arrive at, at a good policy. Okay? So that's why uh, data efficiency is something really important. Okay, so let's start with a simple example to illustrate a, a model-based technique. So we're gonna go back to a, a little maze that we saw a few lectures ago. Um, so here we start in, let's say, cell one. Okay, so we start in cell one, and then perhaps we can um, simply uh, follow uh, this policy. And then whenever we execute the action, so in cell one we would execute the action up, and then most often we will end up in cell one, two, but perhaps in some cases we might end up in the next cell to one. Okay, so if we do this, if we simply execute a policy, we can observe some trajectories, right? And now if we're gonna do a model-based reinforcement learning technique, what we can do is estimate what are the probabilities of reaching different state given some actions. So like if I'm in uh, state one, three, so this would be this cell here. Uh, sorry, no, state one, three, so it would be this cell here. Um, then I execute the action right, so we expect that we would end up in cell two, three, right? Um, but we might slip and then simply go down instead. And now we could look at our trajectories and simply see whenever we were in state one, three, what happened next, right? Because in each one of those cases, we executed the action right, and then what happens next? So here, um, you see in two cases out of three, we ended up in two, three, and then in one case out of three, we ended up in one, two, okay? So now this gives us an estimate, so we can simply take relative frequency counts, to estimate the, the rewards. Uh, sorry, not the rewards, the, 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 the transition probabilities. Okay, so here in this example, let's just assume that the reward function is known, and then we're gonna get a reward of minus 0 0.04 uh, for all non-terminal states. And, and really the question here is, we don't know what is a transition model, but we could estimate it simply based on the trajectories. Okay, if we do this, once we have our estimates of the transition probabilities, then at some level, we've already seen how we can find a good policy or a good value function. We could just use this information directly into Bellman's equation and then solve for the optimal value function and at the same time the optimal policy. All right, so, so the idea is that once we use this information from the model, then we can do planning. Right, so at the beginning of the course, we talked about value iteration, policy iteration, and modified policy iterations. These were three techniques that we saw that can be used whenever we've got a fully specified Markov decision process. But then if the problem is that we're missing some information, like we don't have a transition model, then maybe what we can do is just try to estimate that missing information, so get the transition distribution, and then optimize our policy or value function afterwards based on that information. Okay, so, so this is all good. The problem is that we will need to learn all the transition probabilities because here we need to have a, a full model if we want to, to specify, well, if we want to use uh, Bellman's equation in, in, in this fashion. But um, in any case, um, the idea is that we're, we could simply start executing some policy, observe some transitions, estimate the transition probabilities, and then after that, optimize our policy.
Okay, so with model-based reinforcement learning, we could summarize what I described as an example as follows. So at every step, we're going to execute an action. Then we're going to observe the resulting state and reward. But then after that, this is where we update our transition or reward model. And based on that model, then we're going to update the policy or, or the value function. Okay, so you see the key is that we've added this step here of updating the transition and reward model because then the way we optimize the policy and the value function will be based on the model as opposed to directly based on, on the sample. Okay, so here's a, a simple, um, some simple pseudocode for model-based reinforcement learning that uses value iteration for the planning part. So at every step, we're going to select and execute some action. We're going to observe the resulting state and the reward. And then let's say that we update some counts. We're going to count how often we end up in certain state action pairs. And also here, state action state triple. The reason for those counts is because then we can use them to estimate the, the transition and, and the reward model. Right? So, the transition model is just going to be the relative frequency counts. So we can simply um, take this ratio. And then for the reward model, here the reward function should be the expected reward whenever we're in state S and execute action A. So here we can um, simply take our immediate reward that we just got and then combine it with our previous estimate of the average using this, um, this incremental update. Okay. So, so we can do this each time we execute an action, observe the next state and the reward, we update our uh, transition model and reward model, and then after that we just plug this into value iteration, Bellman's equation, and then solve for V star. Right? And then we could repeat this um, and then we're going to repeat this until V star converges. And here when I say V star converges, I don't mean that it converges within value iteration. I mean that it converges in this outer loop because the problem is that we're going to keep changing our model. So I guess we want the model to converge and then as a result the value function to converge. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's right. So here it's model based, so that's why you see I'm explicitly estimating the transition probabilities. In model free reinforcement learning, uh, the classic example would be Q learning, right? And in Q learning, we, we don't have any transition probabilities. We never represent that, right? Instead, we directly estimate the Q function, right, where we use the samples as a way to approximate some expectation that would be normally done with respect to the transition. Right, so here you see the benefit of having a model is that I can do the expectation explicitly, right? whereas in model free reinforcement learning I don't have the model, so here what I'm forced to do is to do an expectation that is approximate by just using one sample. Yeah, so here I have both the transition and the reward model. In uh, model free reinforcement learning, I don't need either of them, right? I don't need the reward model either because what would happen is that you see, I select an action, I observe S prime, and I observe R, right? And then I, I simply use that directly in Q learning to update my Q function by looking at a temporal difference, right? But then there's no reward model because I just take a reward sample. And then there's no transition model because I just have one sample S prime from my transition model. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, what I described is all simple and nice in the context of um, uh, tabular um, models that, that, that are not uh, very difficult. But now, what if we consider a robotics domain? Um, and now, also, we could consider games like Atari games that are quite complex because here, uh, the state for a, ro a robot might be uh, the position and velocity of all the uh, actuators. Um, so I might have, well, I, I guess, yeah, every part might have a position and a location, uh, sorry, a position and a velocity. And, and then so if there's a lot of joints, right, then there's going to be a lot of um, uh, state features, and then it's going to be something quite complex. In the, game, in the case of Atari, uh, or otherwise video games in general, uh, there the idea is that a state is represented by an image, so it's essentially an array of pixels, and then it's, it's something very complex, right? So what I described just before here assumes that I can enumerate every state action pairs, and in fact, every state action and next state triple, right? But I'm not going to be able to do this in environments like that. So what can we do? So the obvious answer is whenever uh, you know, the state space gets complex or the action space gets complex is that we use some function approximator. And then in particular here, we could approximate the transition model as well as the reward model with some function approximator. So again, we could assume a linear model. So um, for predicting what the next state is going to be given the current state and action, perhaps I could consider a linear Gaussian model. So uh, this is a Gaussian distribution with respect to S prime. And then this Gaussian distribution could be uh, parameterized by a mean that's essentially a linear combination of the state and actions with respect to some weights, right? So some weighted combination of the state action features. So, so this is a very simple way of coming up with a transition model that would be linear. If I want to consider nonlinear models, then um, what is also popular is to consider Gaussian processes. Uh, now, okay, we haven't talked about Gaussian processes in this course, but essentially Gaussian processes are Gaussian distributions with an infinite number of dimensions. Um, so they can be quite nice in terms of um, uh, parameterizing the dynamics, and then they have been used quite a bit for, for that purpose. So here uh, we, we would have a, a Gaussian process that has, again, a mean. Um, well, okay, I actually... Um, yeah, so, so here there should be a kernel as well. So yeah, this slide is not totally accurate. In any case, I guess, yeah, I could use a Gaussian process whenever I want to have something that is nonlinear. And, and then um, if I want something that is nonlinear but deterministic, I could also use a neural network. So neural networks are often used for this. And here I'm going to use T of SA to indicate that I've got a transition model that is deterministic, it returns S prime, and then perhaps this transition model is parameterized by a neural network. Okay, so now if we have a complex state and action space that requires us to have maybe a neural network to parameterize these things, then in model-based reinforcement learning, part of this is that we're gonna use our model to do some planning. But now if we have a transition model and a reward model that let's say is represented by a neural network or even just a linear function, it's not obvious how we're going to do our planning, right? So planning before boiled down to doing value iteration or policy iteration, but how do you do this whenever you've got some really complex state and action uh, spaces? So one solution to that is that we're gonna to have to approximate the planning as well. And maybe we don't have to plan for the entire space. Maybe we can do partial planning. Um, okay, so partial planning could be achieved by in fact doing a few steps of Q learning. And then we could also do a few steps of policy gradient. So 
The idea is that Q-learning and policy gradient, we saw them as, as model-free reinforcement learning techniques that essentially use samples directly from the environment. But now, whenever we've got a model that's complex, maybe from our complex model, we could just sample as well some transitions and some rewards. And then these would be simulated transitions and rewards. And then we could just plug them into Q-learning and policy gradient to keep on learning so that then they would learn not just on the real experience, but on the simulated experience as well. And when we're learning on a simulated experience, we're essentially planning. Okay? So we can use them for, for that purpose. Okay, so in that case, let's say that we replace value iteration that we saw before with Q learning. Um, then we would obtain the following algorithm. Um, so here, as before, we select and execute an action, then observe the next state and a reward. But now when we want to update our transition and reward model, we, we can't enumerate the states and actions anymore. Right? So our, our updating our model is going to be more complex than just counting the frequency of state action pairs. Instead, what we do is, let's say that we uh, have a function approximator, um, and then let's say um, that my function approximator uses some weights. In the case of the transition model, I'm going to denote those weights by WT. Okay, so WT will mean that these are the weights for the transition model. And then my transition model here, I'm just going to denote it by T of SA. So here, T of SA can be a neural network. It could be a Gaussian process. It could be a sum product network. It could be a linear function approximator. Uh, all, of, all of those are fine, right? So just think of this as some function, right? And then there's, there's a mathematical um, formulation for what that function is. And then for the purpose of the algorithm, it's not a big deal what it is, right? So we're just going to take the gradient here. So the idea is that if we want to update our transition model, and then our transition model is, is represented by some function approximator, then a general way of doing this is that perhaps we could just take a step in the direction of the gradient where we minimize some error function. So here, normally, we would like to compare T of SA with S prime, right? because T of SA is essentially our transition model. It tells us when we go from a certain state, execute an action, we should end up into a new state that should correspond to S prime. Right? But then if, if that's not exactly S prime, right, then this is going to be our error measure. And now if we minimize Euclidean distance and take a step in the direction of the gradient, then we would obtain the following update. Right? So we would take the, 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 the difference, the error, times the gradient and take a step uh, determined by our learning rate alpha uh, to modify our weight in this fashion. Now, this is for the transition model. <clears throat> we can do the same thing with the reward model. So here, I'm, I'm denoting by R of SA what is our, what, what is our function approximator that, that approximates uh, the expected reward. And then same trick, right? So normally, I would like the difference between those two to be as small as possible. So I'm going to take the error times the gradient uh, and also times a, a learning rate to do my update. Okay, and in both cases here, what I'm implicitly doing is minimizing Euclidean distance. Okay, so this, this is now my update uh, for the transition and reward model. And, and now with WT and WR, I essentially have a model. And, and then what I would need to do next, in, and this is what this loop is about, is to essentially solve the corresponding Markov decision process. But now it's a complex Markov decision process, right? Because I, I have um, a function approximator for my transition model and same thing for my reward model. So I can't just do some basic linear algebra. Um, I'll, I'll have to, to do something, um, a, a, I guess, a little more complex. And then one approach that we've seen is that we can simply take um, uh, a, 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 a gradient-based technique. So here this would be a gradient Q learning. Um, so I could measure what is the temporal difference between um, 
my current estimate, so here Q of SA is my current estimate for the Q function. And then this would be my new estimate or my target based on my current reward plus future rewards. Okay? And then I take the difference. This gives me my temporal difference. And then I can plug this into my uh, gradient update where I have the learning rate times the temporal difference times the gradient. Right? And then I can update in this fashion the weights that are associated with the Q function. <clears throat> okay, so, so then you can see that in this algorithm we're going to alternate between updating the model and then after that updating our Q function. And then once, we, um, once the Q function converges, then I guess we, we, we have presumably the optimal policy. Okay. Any questions regarding this? Yeah. Do you assume that the model is deterministic? Um, right. So okay, in this particular example, yes. So so here I am assuming that it is deterministic. Um, in fact, when it is deterministic, there's a few things that do simplify. Uh, in particular, you see when when I do this update with the temporal difference then what's nice is, is that if my transition model is deterministic, this is not anymore just a, a one sample approximation to the expectation. Uh, this is in fact equal to the expectation, so it's going to converge faster and, and, it, and it's going to be better. Uh, but if I had instead a transition model that was stochastic, I could still do something similar. Uh, the main difference is that when I update my transition model, I could not update it by taking a step in the direction of the gradient that minimizes Euclidean distance, but instead I might want to simply um, uh, minimize cross entropy, right? So I, I, I would do a different type of update here. This would be the main difference. Yeah. Um, Sorry, um, what is it that's the same? Oh, right, are the learning rates the same? So here, you see I wrote alpha t, alpha r, alpha q, which allows the learning rates to be different. Um, so here, as, as we discussed before, the learning rates should also have some kind of decreasing schedule, right? Um, and, and then, yeah, I, I guess this, this simply indicates that, that we, we can adjust them differently but we could also make them the same. Yeah. Okay, so now the previous algorithm that we saw, um, it should remind you a little bit the model-free Q-learning algorithm that we discussed with a replay buffer. Okay, so when we discussed Q-learning and we wanted to deal with continuous states or large state spaces, then we said we have to use a function approximator and, and then um, we, we ended up with an algorithm that was in fact quite similar to this, but instead of having a model, it uses a replay buffer. Okay, so yeah, so in the case of a replay buffer, what happens is that you, you have some, um, yeah, you have an algorithm that is generally simpler and then it uses real samples from the environment, but on the other hand, it does not generalize as well to other state action pairs. So in Q learning, the goal is to estimate the Q function, right? And then if we are doing Q learning in a model free fashion with a, a replay buffer, what happens is that at every step, we execute an action, observe uh, some, some reward in the next state, and then we store that into our replay buffer, right? And then after this, we, we sample from the replay buffer lots of previous experiences and then update our Q function based on that, right? Now in contrast, with um, a model-based technique, what we're doing is instead of using a replay buffer, we're using all the previous experiences to learn a model. And then what we do is that we use our model to essentially generate 
some experiences and then update our queue function based on those experiences. Right, so if I just go back to this algorithm, right, then the main difference is that with um, model free queue learning, I would, I would have here a loop that would say sample S and A, um, but then I guess here, um, yeah, so sample S and A, but it would be from a replay buffer as opposed to just sample them arbitrarily. And, and then I would not use uh, the transition model or the reward model. I would simply use what was in the replay buffer, right? And then at, at some level, you see the replay buffer is storing all the previous experience. And then what the model does is also kind of like storing all the previous experience, but not in an explicit fashion. It's storing it in a way that uh, perhaps could be more um, directly used or more meaningful because at the end of the day, that previous experience, it was, it was effectively just samples from some underlying model that we didn't know. And then here what we're saying is, well, let's, let's learn that model. Let's learn it in, in an explicit fashion, right? So, so basically, this algorithm and the previous one, it differ mostly in this notion that here we are learning explicitly a model. And, and then when we update our Q function, it's going to be based on some samples that I denote by S hat and A hat to indicate that these are, are not real experience, right? This is imagined experience or fake experience, right? And then I'm gonna take some steps in the direction of the gradient that's based on that fake experience that comes from my model, right? Whereas if I use a replay buffer, I would store into the replay buffer all my real experience, and then I would sample from my replay buffers on that real experience, and then I, I, would, I would essentially do the updates based on the real experience. So that's, that's the main difference, right? And then here you see I use the, the hat notation to indicate that, that these are not the current real state and current real action. These are just fake ones that I've sampled, right? Just, just so that I can query my model and, and do some updates. But then you see I've got here the real action and then the real state. So in the outer loop, you see, I do have still the real action and the real state. It's just that whenever I get to the point where I update my Q function, I don't do it based on the real states and the real actions. I do it based on some fake states and fake actions with my model that are both together implicitly summarizing my previous experience. Right? So it's sort of like this intermediate step where I, I summarize my previous experience with a model. The benefit of doing this is that if I have a, a good model, it will generalize well beyond just the, the, the actual experience that I gathered over time, right? The, the trouble is that if my model is not good, then the generalization won't be good, and, and then I might be better off, in fact, just sticking to the real experience that I had before, and therefore just to a replay buffer. Okay, so, so in practice, what, what this all means is that it is generally simpler and safer to work with a replay buffer because you have the real experience, you, you, you're, you're not doing anything to it, and you know because it's real that it's valid experience, and then you can learn from that. But then the problem is that it's unclear how you can generalize to other state action pairs that are not part of your real experience. When you've got a model, then you can use the model to generalize to these other state action pairs, and then you can generate some fake state action pairs and see what would happen with those. If your generalization is good, then this will be something beneficial, and then this will converge faster. If your model is bad, then you're going to imagine that you're not doing some updates based on what you think are, are reasonable state action reward triples, but um, they, they're not going to be correct uh, because perhaps your model is wrong, and then this could harm the overall learning of, of the algorithm. Yeah. Uh, why don't we update the Q function using both the real experience and the Ah, excellent question. Yeah, so we can indeed 
uh, update the Q function using both type of experiences. This is what is known as Dyna, and then we're going to see in a, in a moment this approach. Yeah. So, so there is no feedback for the transition yeah. model and reward model from the Q function, right, in this linearity. So why don't we just uh, take the updating of the Q function outside of the outer loop? I mean. Um, so, okay, you, you'd like to use what we've learned about the Q function yeah. to update, the again, the our model. transition model. Um, Right. Well, I, I, I'm not sure how we would do this because, I mean, the Q function is telling us about values of whenever you execute a policy for, you know, a certain amount of time. But it's not telling us anything, at least directly, about uh, what would be the next state, right? So it's storing yeah, different so information. What I'm asking is, like, why don't we just uh, update the Q learning function, like, uh, at the end, after we repeat this process and update the transition model and the reward model? And then update the Q learning function at the end because like uh, the Q learning like uh, this Q, Q value function is not gonna give any information for the updating of the transition and reward model. Right? That's right. So yeah, the Q function does not provide any information about the uh, transition and the reward model. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how it could anyway. And and here, I mean, the transition the reward model really, I guess, uh, they need to update they need to be updated based on experience that correspond to, to these triples of an action, actually quadruples of an, a state, an action, the next state, and the reward, right? So this is what we need to update the transition model and, and as well as the reward model. And, and that's what we're using. Yeah. So the, sorry, sorry, the updation of the Q is just used for X use A? Say that again. The, the, the updation of the queue is the used to execute action for the next round. So yeah, the update of queue is based on, on these samples here that, that are fake samples. They do not necessarily correspond to our current state action pair. Yeah, but uh, sorry, I have the same question. Yes, the, uh, uh, what, what is the new usage of the queue for the updates of the transition and reward? We're, we're not using the queue function to update uh, the, the reward or transition model. The purpose of the Q function is just so that from that, afterwards we could extract a policy, right? So in fact, okay, here, what is not written explicitly, again, is this idea that once we have a Q function, when we get to that first step here and we say select and execute A, the select of A, right, would, would take into account the Q function perhaps do a certain amount of exploration, maybe using epsilon greedy or something along those lines, right? So, so yeah, so this is where the Q function gets used um, in, in that first line after that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so to summarize, the, the discussion that we just had is that uh, here we could just stick with traditional Q learning with a replay buffer and, and then it is by far the simplest approach. Um, and, and then it works with real samples, so it's also safe. There won't be any bias that will creep in or anything like this. The trouble is that we can't generalize easily to other state action pairs beyond the ones that, that we've actually experienced, right? Because in our replay buffer, that's all we store. We store the experience as it is. Uh, whereas if we do partial planning here with a model, then it's going to be more complex because we have to learn that model. Um, and now there's a bit of a danger because when we're going to update our policy, it's going to be based not so much on real samples or real experience, but on simulated samples. Okay? And, and now if, if our model is okay, those simulated samples will essentially correspond to something close to the real sample. So, so the benefit is that we're going to be able to generate as many as we wish, right? And then this will drive the learning faster. So, so here, if we have a good model, then it will generalize to other state action pairs, and, and this will be good. But again, it, it depends. So this can help or this could hurt. Okay, um, yeah.
Okay, so just before there was a question where somebody asked, can we do both? Can we update our policy based on the real samples and, and then the simulated ones? And the answer is yes, that, that, that is something quite natural to do. And this has been known in the literature as DINA. Uh, so DINA is this idea that we're going to learn an explicit transition and, and reward model. So, so, so it's model based, okay, and then we're going to do some planning based on that model. But then since we also get to um, um, observe some, some actual states and actions at every step, Right, so we do have some real experience, and then we might as well learn from that too. Right, so we should learn from both. And then so the picture uh, then becomes the following. So before with model-based reinforcement learning, we had essentially what is in black in this picture. Right, so we have the environment. It, it provides us at every step um, about the state and the reward. We use that to update our model. Based on the model, we do a certain amount of planning. And then based on the plan, then we're going to update our policy or value function and then select an action. Right? So this was the loop for model-based reinforcement learning. But now we could introduce another arc right here that could say, well, the environment is giving us a state and a reward at every step. Instead of just feeding it to update our model, why can't we use it as well to update our policy and value function? Right, this is what we did in model free reinforcement learning. There was nothing wrong with doing this. And why can't we use that information directly as well? So we certainly can. And this leads to what is known as DINA. So now you see we have essentially two loops inside this graph. And then both of them are going to be used to update our policy and, and value function. OK, so here's an example of DynaQ. So it's uh, essentially Dyna with Q learning. Um, so we have, as before, the updates to our transition and reward model that would correspond to taking a step in the direction of the gradient. But now, because we're also going to learn from the real experience, then we need to update our Q function based on that real experience. So we're also going to compute a temporal difference based on that real experience and then update our Q function. Okay, so, so yeah, so this red part here, right, corresponds to essentially uh, this link that I just added here. Okay, because you see we're doing a Q, Q function update. And then after this, um, we also do, we continue to update our Q function, but now based on, 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 on the fake experience or the simulated experience, Right, so this is where we do the planning part. So this here corresponds to essentially uh, this part, in fact, to, to this arc right here. Because right? you see we've got two arcs that feed into this box for updating the policy value function. Right? And then the planning part is what we have right here. And then you can see that uh, it, it's a S hat and A hat that indicate simulated experience in contrast to uh, the direct learning where we use S and A that are the real state and action pair. Yeah? Um, I think the first line in red up there, uh, so you said that corresponds to updating based on real experience. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, um, right, let's see, so good point. Okay, so yeah, I need to change this slide, because <laughs> yeah, so, since we're updating based on real experience, then um, yeah, so here we should not be using T and R, we should be using the, the real experience. Um, so in this case, uh, this, this would be S prime, right? And then this would be R, okay, the, the small R that, that comes from here. Yeah, very good point. Okay, so I will I will change this slide and, and correct this. Yeah. 
Yes, very good point. So yeah, so, so you're hitting exactly on the main problem here of model-based reinforcement learning, so, and, and including Dyna. So whenever we've got a model, and then we start doing updates to our Q function based on the model, at the very beginning, the model is going to be poor. It's going to be very inaccurate because we won't have seen a lot of data. And, and then, you know, maybe we don't really want to use it to update our, our policy yet. Um, so, okay, one, one simple trick here would be to just say that um, you do not do the loop for updating the Q function based on the model until uh, you've seen enough data that you have a model that can be reasonable. But I mean, this does not completely get rid of the problem because, I mean, still, at any point in time you've seen a finite amount of data, your model is not going to be accurate. So there's a risk here that when you do these updates, you're going to essentially um, overfit to this inaccurate model and then obtain a, a, a policy that is suboptimal as a result of that. Yeah. So on the first one, when we, when we kind of sample, uh, sample the, the action, what kind of like information do we use? Do we use like a, make use of the information from the Q function? Yes. The model itself? <laughs> Yes, that's right. So here, uh, again, when I write select action A, it means that we're going to use some strategy that includes some form of exploration, but obviously will be based on our estimate of the Q function. Okay, not the transition model, right? Because we got um, Right. Yeah, so, so here, I mean, the easiest thing is really just to use the Q function because the Q function allows you to compare the different actions. Um, you're asking, can we also use the model, the transition model? Um, I mean, yes, but, but then that would mean that we're, we're doing some form of planning based on that. Um, at, at least in this simple algorithm, I mean, we would, we would not likely do that. Okay, so in the previous like, uh, graph, that arc from like, the, the planning, it's just a planning for the, for the, for the sample to learn the Q function, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's just uh, an arc to indicate that we learn the Q function. Okay. Yeah. But the next action, we, we plan the next action based on the Q function. Right? That's right. So we select the next action based on the Q function and not so much based on our model. But I guess, yeah, we, we well, we're going to see in a moment an approach that will do that. So Monte Carlo Tree Search will actually use the model as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, all right, so how well does DynaQ perform in practice? So here, um, there's a simple graph that shows for a maze problem where the task is to uh, reach the goal G here from the start state here. And then again, it's as usual where uh, you have four actions to go up, down, left, right. And, and then there's some noise whenever you execute those actions. You also have uh, some walls, and then you need to navigate and arrive at the goal as quickly as possible. Okay? So now, uh, what this shows is um, the number of episodes on the x-axis, and then um, we've got the number of steps per episode. So here the idea is that the episode would terminate only once we reach the goal state. Okay? So in this setting, we can determine how good is a plan or how good is a policy based on how long it takes before we, we reach the goal state. And then because there's going to be some exploration that chooses some actions at random, even if our policy is, is bad, then I mean at some point just due to luck, we're going to eventually reach the goal state. So that's why at the beginning, you see it might take a very long time, but then very quickly it improves. And then if we simply do uh, direct reinforcement learning, as in direct Q learning, right, then it does take quite a bit of time before we find a very good policy. Um, but now, if we do DynaQ with five planning steps, so that means that every iteration, if I just go back here, when I say repeat a few times, I will repeat this, let's say, five times, okay, then. Um, I, I obtain a much better curve, and then if I do 50 planning steps, then it's, it's even better, okay? Now, this is in, in a scenario where it worked nicely, 
Uh, even when our model was not accurate, it still helped. But then there are situations where it could get worse. But in any case, this is what we would like to see in general whenever we use model-based reinforcement learning or DynaQ, right? That, that planning with our model uh, should help and then it should essentially reduce the amount of, of uh, real data that, that we need. Yeah? So there, there was a question earlier regarding um, that the model might not be particularly good in the beginning. So my some method to help with that be to, like in a Gaussian process, also maintain a measure for how much information we have for a certain um, state action pair and way to be learning that. Absolutely, yeah. So, so you're you're right on. In fact, you're one lecture ahead. <laughs> okay. So here, yeah. If we don't have a model that is good. Right, then part of the problem is because we're, we should really not commit to a particular model, but instead model the uncertainty about the things that we're not sure in our model. And, and then a Gaussian process will be one way of doing this. And then this will um, at least mitigate tremendously any type of bias that might come from, from an inaccurate model. And then, and then we can obtain very good results that are much, much more robust. Okay, um, all right, let me talk about now, given that, um, yeah, let me go back to this slide. So okay, in, 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 this, in this algorithm, what happens is that you see this part is where we do the planning to update the Q function. But as we discussed, this Q function is really going to be used in the next iteration to select an action. So at some level, you could say, well, why are we doing all of this work here to update the Q function at some potentially arbitrary state action pairs, right? We should really just focus our planning to the current state because we're going to use our Q function to simply select the next action, right? So, so then we know what is our current state. We, we have our current state. Um, uh, either as input or at least at every iteration, we, we know what is our current state. And then the first thing we're going to try to do is to select an action. So we, we should perhaps just focus our efforts on doing the planning with respect to the current state. Okay, so for planning with respect to the current state, um, there is one approach um, that is quite effective known as Monte Carlo tree search. Okay, so the idea here is that if we are in a certain state, then we could build a search tree to decide what would be the best actions uh, to execute up to a certain horizon. Okay, so in terms of planning, right, we, we saw earlier how we can use value iteration, policy iteration, and so on. But an, another approach that is in fact very, very simple is really just to build a search tree. If, if all I'm trying to do is to come up with what might be the best course of action from a specific starting state, then building a search tree is an effective way of doing this. Right? So this does not give us a full policy. It only tells us what we should do from a certain state. Um, but then at the same time, it's going to be something cheaper. So okay, in a certain state, S1 here, perhaps I could choose between action A and action B. If I choose action A, then perhaps as a probability 0.9, I'll end up in state S2. 0.1, I'll end up in state S3. Now, depending on which state I end up in, again, I can choose between action A and B. Then there's a probability, again, that I might reach different states, and so on. Right? So, so building this search tree is sort of like, you know, a, a, a basic approach. Um, you can do this up to a certain horizon. The obvious problem is that if you look at this tree, this tree will get very large very quickly, right? So it, it grows exponentially with uh, the horizon. Um, so at every step here, uh, you see we have a branching factor of two, so everything doubles. Uh, we might have a branching factor that is even larger if we have many actions or many states that are reachable, so then it will blow up even faster. Okay, so the question then will be, if we're going to do planning just from the current state, 
how can we do it tractably? In other words, how could we perhaps expand a search tree, but maybe just the parts that are important, not the entire search tree, because that's something exponentially large. So there are three ideas that are commonly used in, in practice. Um, so here, if we're going to build a search tree, uh, the first thing we might try to do is to say, well, let's not build it too deep. Because if we build it very deep, right, then it's going to blow up exponentially with the depth. And, and that's not going to scale. So we can't afford to go deep. So let's, let's try to cut it off. But if we're going to cut it off, that means we're going to need to have some good estimates of what is the value in each state. OK, so, um, yeah, so here, perhaps in the leaves, we can approximate the values by using a default policy. So this is where we're going to use um, a Monte Carlo technique. So we could, once we reach a, a leaf, simply uh, do what is known as a rollout. So we take a default policy. Let's say that this default policy is pi. And then we're simply going to estimate the value of that default policy by executing it, um, recording what are those rewards, and, and then summing them. And then I'm going to do that multiple times. Perhaps I'm going to do this n times. And then this will give me an, an estimate of the expected reward that is possible with that policy. And then let me just stick that as my um, value estimate for, for the leaf. Now, this is based on, on a default policy. This default policy might not be uh, you know, a correct policy or the best policy, but at least it will give us an estimate. And then we can cut off the search. So, so this is. This is a, a good approximation. It's something that's reasonable to do in practice. Now, this will take care of the problem of going too deep, right? So we'll be able to cut off the search. But now there's still a problem where uh, for the chance nodes, these were the nodes with circles here, where I, I have um, essentially um, uh, an expectation with respect to the children. Perhaps what I could do is approximate this expectation by sampling from my transition model. So here I have a model, right? So I'm in a model-based setting, so I have a model. And, and then I might as well use it. Now, if I have too many possible states that are reachable, so then computing the expectation is going to be something expensive. And then if there's a lot of states reachable, uh, it means that here, I'm going to have a branching factor that is very large. Right? So, so then the question is now, if I don't want my, my tree to become too wide, right, can I prune some of those branches? Right? Can I trim them so that I, I just have a few children? And then one way of doing this is, is in fact, just to sample. Right? Because this is, this is an expectation with respect to all possible reachable states. And, and then, so if there's too many of them, then I'm just going to take a sample, and this will reduce the number. OK, so that's the second idea. And then in practice, this will mean that I can estimate the, the Q function or the Q value for those states um, simply by sampling. Uh, so here I'm going to have a sum where I sample a bunch of uh, S primes based on my transition distribution. And this will be effective whenever I've got lots of possible reachable states. OK, and we also need to do something about the decision nodes. Because what if also for the decision nodes, so like let's say I'm in this state here. Now I get to select among several possible actions. In this graph, I only have two actions. But what if I had a choice between thousands of actions? Right, so, so this would make my graph very wide again. And I would like to trim that. I, I need to, to work with something that is smaller, fewer actions. So how can I work with fewer actions? So one idea here will be to expand only the most promising actions. And then we've seen already some ideas uh, based on upper confidence bounds, where here, the, I guess at a decision node, the problem is that I'm trying to select an action among many possible actions. But then some actions are going to be more promising than others. 
and I can determine how promising they are simply by looking at their Q value estimate and then I could add to this a bonus uh, for exploration that corresponds to an, an upper confidence bound. Okay, so, so we're going to use this idea as well. Now if we combine those three ideas together, this will lead to uh, some form of Monte Carlo tree search. Okay, so there's many ways of defining algorithms for Monte Carlo tree search, but in any case, they tend to use these three ideas in, in some fashion. Okay, and Monte Carlo tree search became very popular, in fact, in the game of Go. So for computer Go, um, it, it, the state of the art, um, many years ago was in fact to use Monte Carlo tree search. So these were some of the computer program and, and then they were um, uh, among the best. Up until 2015 when deep reinforcement learning took over, but even though here it says deep reinforcement learning, the truth is that uh, if you recall a few lectures ago when we talked about AlphaGo, um, so one of the early versions of AlphaGo had several steps and then the last step was in fact a tree search. So, so it was really deep reinforcement learning combined still with Monte Carlo tree search. So what I'll do now is I'll explain this Monte Carlo tree search technique and then we'll see in fact what was the variant that was also used in, in AlphaGo. Okay, so Monte Carlo tree search um, has several um, parts. At a very high level, we have the, um, an, an outer loop here where what we're going to do is start by creating a, a root node and then, um, uh, so we're, we're going to repeat a loop uh, for as long as, as we have time. So typically this is until we need to make our next decision because the whole point here is that we're doing planning from the current state to really just determine what should be the next action we're going to pick, okay? So if, in, if it's the context of a game, right? So at every step you need to perform an action and then you will have a certain amount of time to perform that action. So here you could do Monte Carlo tree search for that amount of time. So that's why here we're gonna do this loop uh, for a time that corresponds to our computational budget. And then in that loop, we're going to have here three steps. The first step is that we're going to follow um, uh, a certain path into a, a policy tree. Then we're going to, uh, after that, compute a value for the leaf that we reach using our default policy. And then after that, we're going to back up that value to update, um, uh, update the policy tree. Okay, so yeah, let me draw something here. Yeah, so okay, so for the first step, right, we're gonna create a root node. So we're gonna have a root node like this. And then after this in the loop, uh, the first part is going to um, essentially follow um, a policy tree to reach uh, a certain node uh, which is in a leaf. Okay, so here I could imagine that I have a tree like this, okay, and now what the, the, this line indicates is that I'm going to essentially follow the, the policy that is encoded in this tree. The idea is that in this tree, every node is going to have some Q value, and, and then we're going to be able to distinguish between different actions. So I start here, perhaps I'm going to follow this edge, okay, then maybe after this I follow this edge, and then after that this edge, and then see this edge. So here I would have a path that would be selected um, as I go down the tree, okay? So this is what this step does, okay? Once I reach a leaf, so node L indicates that this is a node which is a leaf, so the L indicates that it's a leaf, um, then what I'm going to do is simply run 
my default policy. So I'm going to have some policy that might not be the best one. Uh, in fact, at some point in time, people were using default policies that were literally random policies. But um, here, you might as well use the best policy you can. So it just has to be some default policy. And the idea is that in that leaf node here, we need to estimate the value of that leaf. Okay, so as we discussed earlier, we don't want to go too deep when we build our tree, right? And then one way to, to prevent the depth from getting too large will be to essentially cut off the tree by having a good estimate in the leaf. Now, to do this, so this is where we're going to do what is known as a rollout. So a rollout is going to be essentially executing a policy pi uh, for a certain amount of time and then estimating from this um, a return g, right? So, so this will be g pi, um, let's say starting at uh, sl, um, or actually, yeah, no, let me write nl just to be consistent with, with the slides. Um, so, so then we're going to have an estimate that corresponds to the sum of all the rewards when I execute that policy. Okay? And now this is going to be used to now estimate or approximate the value of that node. Okay? So that's the second part. And then the third part is going to be to back up this node. So we're going to, sorry, to back up the value from the leaf all the way up to the root. So now we've got a new estimate. It's a Monte Carlo estimate. And now we're going to back this up uh, along our path and then update the Q estimate at each one of those nodes. OK, so that's what the third step does. <clears throat> OK, so now let's get into the details of, of these three steps. So for the policy tree technique, um, the idea is that we're going to go down the path, uh, or at least find a path that is considered uh, the best path. Um, and the idea is that, yeah, we, we go down until we reach a terminal node, OK? Um, and then if at some point we reach a node that has not been fully expanded, then we're going to do some expansion step. Uh, but in any case, the goal is to reach um, a leaf node where at every step, you see, we choose the best child. We're choosing the best child will be done by essentially um, the following expression. All right, so this expression will look at, um, so, okay, here this is arg max. Um, it got separated in two, but this is arg max, right, of the value of a child plus some bonus that corresponds to some form of upper confidence bound. Okay, so, so then the idea is that, you see, we're going to gradually um, estimate values of, at, at, at each one of the nodes. And then those values, right, they might or might not be accurate. And this will depend on how often we visit a node. So if we haven't visited a node very often, then its estimate is going to be perhaps inaccurate. And then we're going to have a lot of uncertainty. And therefore, here we're going to have a large exploration bonus. And then we're going to make that node more promising and therefore more likely to be chosen. So this is just like in bandits when we talked about uh, the UCB algorithm, upper confidence bound. Now the difference is that we're not in the context of a bandit, but in the context of a tree. So here, because we're in the context of a tree, in fact, the overall algorithm is going to be called upper confidence bound tree. Okay, so UCT, the T is for tree. Okay, but it's essentially a variant of what we saw for bandits. Okay, so that's how we select our best child. And then for the default policy, uh, all we're going to do is you see at every step, we're going to sample an action from our default policy, execute it, observe what is the next state, and, and then return the reward. Okay, so, so this is what we do at, at every step. Okay, so um, the final part is the backup. So you see, once we've gone down a path, then 
did a rollout to obtain an estimate. Now we need to back this up to update um, our Q estimates, or in this case, I guess, our value estimates. Uh, so it's very simple. So in general, what we would do is simply take the average of all these estimates that we, we get at every run of the algorithm, and I can uh, compute this average in this manner, where I, I simply increment my count for how many times I've visited that node, and, and then simply update the average. Okay, so, so it's as simple as that. Now, this is in the context of a single player game, but what we'll see in a moment is that this was also applied for Computer Go, and it is also very popular in many other types of games where you have two players, and here if you have two players that are adversarial, uh, there's something interesting that happens because um, the other player being adversarial will try to essentially minimize the value to, to defeat the first player. So we need to modify the algorithm a little bit. When we do the backup, here we're going to do what is known as a min-max backup. And then the main difference is that we're going to flip the sign of the value that is being returned. Okay? So the idea is that um, if we have two players, we could imagine that let's say we're in Go, uh, there's uh, the white player here that makes a move, then there's the black player that makes a move here, then there's a white player that makes another move, then there's a black player that makes a move, and so on. Right? And now perhaps the white player is going to try to minimize the score, and then the black player is going to try to uh, minimize instead. Right? So they alternate between maximizing and minimizing. And one way of emulating this is just to say that Whatever is the score for white, then for black it's going to be the negative of that score. And then in this way, both of them are going to try to maximize whatever value. It's just that between every turn, we're going to flip the sign of the value. So that's the only difference, right? And then you can use that as well in the context of, of a two-player game that is adversarial. Okay, any questions regarding Monte Carlo tree search? Yeah. Uh, okay, in, in this basic algorithm, no, you do not update the default policy, but obviously that would be a great idea, and I believe this, this has been used. So, so here the, the default policy can be any policy. So I guess here as you do your Monte Carlo tree search and so on, then you would perhaps obtain a better policy over time, and then you might want to swap that in for, uh, to replace your default policy. Yeah. Yes, so this assumes that states can be enumerated. So here, yeah, we assume that we have discrete states and discrete actions. Um, so in the case of games like Go, Chess, uh, many board games, then you have discrete states, you have discrete actions, and, and then so this, this will be fine. Um, now, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, there's an interesting question about how we can generalize this to continuous states and actions. And then obviously, um, for instance here, choosing the best child, right? this argmax cannot be done as is if you cannot enumerate the children. Right? Um, <clears throat> and then if we have continuous states, um, yeah, there might be some issues as well because um, yeah, let me go back to this slide. So I guess if we have continuous states, it means that in principle there could be an infinite number of arcs. Um, so actually, under a chance node, there could be an infinite number of arcs. Uh, the sampling trick might still work, but there's a problem that if you really have a probability density function, then the probability of sampling the same state twice <laughs> Is, could be effectively zero, so you, you will have some, some problems. Okay. And in fact, okay, in, in the Monte Carlo tree search technique that I just explained, I am also making the assumption that um, the transition function is deterministic here. Okay, so this is another restriction in, in this basic algorithm. So you see, I, I just plugged in T of state action, right? So this would return a specific next state S prime. But then if it was determinist, uh, so if it was stochastic, I would have to modify that. 
Yeah. In the two-player game, do you have only one agent or it's two agents? Uh, so, right, okay, so in a two-player game here, yes, you, well, you have at least one agent that's learning. Uh, now, in, what, what typically happens is that you have one agent who will play against itself. Okay, so this way, it's really the same parameters or the same agent that's learning on, on, on both sides. So at least, um, like in Computer Go and many other board games, when people develop their programs, uh, what they, they tend to do is to essentially get their program to play against itself. So there are two players, but it's really the same program on, on both sides. Or at least, it could be two different versions of the same program uh, on, on both sides. Okay, so yeah, what, what I explained here, I would say is, is uh, perhaps a basic Monte Carlo tree search technique, uh, specifically because of this um, way of choosing children uh, that's based on an upper confidence bound, it's what is known as the UCT algorithm. Okay, so this is a, a vanilla approach, a basic approach. Now, uh, this was in, I mean, some of those, some of that uh, was used in, in, in some of these uh, early programs here. But then in the winning strategy with AlphaGo here, it was not this uh, vanilla approach that was used, but a modified version. Um, and the idea is that here they combine Monte Carlo tree search with a policy and a value network. Okay, so if you recall, AlphaGo, we saw that there are these four steps where they first did supervised learning to train a policy network to mimic how experts would play in various situations. Then to go beyond what experts would do, they use a policy gradient technique to essentially gradually improve the policy by self-play. And then they also estimated a value network by using a value gradient technique and then when they combine these together, it essentially becomes some form of actor critique. But then they didn't stop there. They made it model-based, and then they actually used Monte Carlo tree search as well to essentially do a bit of planning from the current state to really boost the performance. Okay, so their search tree worked as follows. So each node is a board configuration, and then let's say that it's Black's turn, so Black would play perhaps um, by putting a stone at this intersection, or it could do this intersection, or in fact any of the three intersections. So here you see there would be a set of uh, possible uh, next states. But then, as we discussed, we're not going to expand all of them, but perhaps only those that are most promising. So this is for Black. Then at the next step, it's white that plays. And then from here, white could put a stone at this intersection or this one and so on. But then again, we're not going to expand all possible um, plays, but only the, uh, the most promising ones. And now, so let's say that we have this tree, right? Then here you could imagine that you go down the tree, uh, reaching this leaf. And then from here, if you want to estimate how good is this board configuration, then um, you can do a rollout with a, a default policy and then simply uh, estimate uh, at the end of your rollout how good is the, the board configuration. Okay, so, so then they had essentially a basic Monte Carlo tree search as I described it. However, the choice of actions um, for creating the policy tree was a little different than, than what I just explained. Okay, so here what they did is they estimated a Q value as well as some bonus U of SA. Now this bonus U of SA was not based on an upper confidence bound, but it was based on a heuristic. So U of SA was essentially using their policy network and then if the policy network already had a high probability for, for an action, then this would be reflected in the numerator here. And then they would also divide by how many times this uh, state action pair was visited. The idea is that if it hasn't been visited very often, then you also want to give a bonus because it should be tried, right? So, so then their exploration bonus 
was based on this heuristic, and, and here again, it's, it's just a heuristic, right? The intuition is that it should make sense that if we have a policy network that thinks that this is a good action, then perhaps we should try it more often. But then if that action has not been visited very often, then also we should have a bonus for that. Okay, and then the Q function itself, uh, which is our, our base value, right? So it was um, obtained through a heuristic two, where it was a convex combination of the value network plus a rollout from uh, that node. Okay, so, so a rollout is essentially um, what you obtain by um, executing the default policy, right? So they would take a convex combination of those two, where lambda determines with what probability we consider the value network versus the rollout. Okay, and, and then, um, yeah, this sum here simply indicates that they would take an average of all the estimates that they would obtain each time that they would visit the state action pair. Okay, so, so I guess, yeah, here there, there's some heuristics in, in how U is defined and how Q is obtained, but otherwise it, is, it follows the overall structure of a Monte Carlo tree search. Okay, so yeah, so this was the, the approach. Um, any questions regarding this? Do we assume V is correct? Uh, do we assume V is correct? So I guess here, I mean, it, it's a heuristic, right? So there's no claim that V is correct. No, it's, it's an estimate. Convex. Oh, convex, yeah. sorry. No, no, so there's no assumption here that V is convex. In fact, V here comes from the value network, which is a neural network that is not convex. Yeah. So. Since we have a tree, we assume that states cannot occur uh, multiple times after an action was performed. So we don't have a graph, like there can't be loops that an action leads to a state that has already. Uh, that, that's a good point. So I believe that's possible. So I mean, here, I guess, uh, in, 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 in games like Computer Go, right, like, I might put a certain stone down and then another one after that down, but what if I did them in the reverse order where the second stone I'd put it down first and then the first stone I'd put it down next, right? Then I, I would, it would lead to the same board configuration. So yeah, so I could definitely have two paths that merge back. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I'm not sure if they would merge that as corresponding to one node, I believe they should. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not familiar enough with the details of, of how this was implemented, but this sounds like a good idea. Yeah. But then it would no longer be tree. Yeah, that's right. So it wouldn't be a tree at this point. It would be an acyclic directed graph. And I guess, yeah, we could question then why is the name Monte Carlo tree search? I guess the assumption is that normally you don't visit the same state twice, or even if you do, you don't try to detect that. But uh, if you can, I mean, here, it, it, it would be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what is the, the part of this, the policy divided by the number of the state reached? Right, so, so again here, the, this is a heuristic, right? So the intuition is that we would like to select actions, normally based on their Q function, but uh, we need to take into account the fact that we have some uncertainty about the Q function, right? So the idea is that then we add an exploration bonus, and now this exploration bonus is defined using a heuristic, right? I'm not claiming that uh, this is necessarily the right thing to do, so it's just a heuristic, but intuitively, we have a policy network that already tells us with what probability an action would be chosen, so if that policy network believes that this action uh, should be chosen with a high probability, then perhaps we should indeed make sure that uh, here, this bonus would be higher as a result of that. So that's why pi appears here. And then dividing by the number of times we visit the state action pair is our standard um, way of accounting for how often uh, a state action pair has been visited. So if it hasn't been visited often, this will trigger a higher bonus as well. The action should be a number. It's a probability, right. So, so here, yeah. 
here, think of this as a, a probabilistic or stochastic uh, policy where this returns a probability. So it is a number, yes. 